Hello, and welcome to another great show. Uh, and we have some uh, interesting questions, some on liturgy and other things that maybe, Father, you can outline what we're going to answer today. Well, we've written a few books together, Father McGinty. Yes, yes oh. a bunch. But how do, we, how do we decide on the subject of those books? Very funny answer, so stay tuned for that. And informative. Always. Always. And we have another question. Why are the Protestant hymns in the Liturgy of the Hours? Yeah, Don't they have their own Liturgy of the Hours? Why are they in there? How'd they get in? But are, are they better than some of the new Catholic Well, we're hymns ecumenical, that's why. And finally, we want to comment on the parable of the prodigal son. What about the older guy in there? That's what we need to know. The what about brother. that poor fatted calf? <laughs> <laughs> that might be one of Father Tucker's puppets. You never and know. All these questions will be answered for you. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to another edition of Web of Faith 2.1 and a half. This is our quarantine edition that we're doing right here at St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi in Flemington, New Jersey. My name is Father Ken Briganti, and for those who are viewing us on YouTube, and for those who are on Facebook would like to view us on YouTube, it's St. Magdalene's Flemington, New Jersey. That's our YouTube website. And those uh, videos will always be there uh, for you to go back at any time that you, you have a question that you'd like to see answered or great to share with other people. It's a great catechetical tool. Or if you're bored. Or if you're bored. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, anyways, my name is uh, Father Ken Brigenzi, as I mentioned, and I am joined here by my illustrious colleague and co-host. Yes, Father John Tregilio, the Diocese of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and Director of Pastoral Formation at Mount St. Mary Seminary in Emmitsburg, Maryland. And today is Father Brigenzi's anniversary of priesthood. Which you're going to see this tomorrow, so it was actually yesterday. But anyways, I want to yeah. read you something that was on my holy card that my old boss, um, Monsignor Rolf, sent to me. It was entitled A Priest by Father Lacordaire, who was a famous homilist around the time of St. John Vianney. In fact, he was so famous that when he went to visit John Vianney, John Vianney felt uh, a bit nervous. He said, here, I have this famous preacher here. But at the end of Father uh, Vianney's sermon, it was Father Lacordaire that went up to him and congratulated him. So, and he, so he was a very humble man. I think he was a Dominican, wasn't he, Father Lacordaire? Yes. Yes. So let's read this beautiful poem, or I'd like to do that for you, on our anniversary. It was Father John's priest, uh, priestly anniversary, May 14th. Thir we're both 32 years. Uh, Father Matt's going to be in June, uh, June 22nd, I think it is. And it's his first anniversary. So that's always exciting, your first year. Uh, and so here's this poem that I'd like to share. A Priest by Father Lacordaire. To live in the midst of the world without wishing its pleasures, to be a member of each family, yet belonging to none, to share all sufferings, to penetrate all secrets, to heal all wounds, to go from men to God and offer him their prayers, and to return from God to men to bring pardon and hope, to have a heart of fire for charity, and a heart of bronze for chastity, to teach and to pardon, to console and bless always. My God, what a life. And it's yours, O priest of Jesus Christ. So if you can remember uh, the priests in your prayers, that we'll always appreciate that. But also, two vocations from our parish. Uh, happy to announce that we both had them on our posse, uh, uh, papal posse show, uh, the big fella, uh, Deacon David Keyes will be ordained a priest on August 22nd, the Queenship of Mary. And the little fellow that was here, Ariel, uh, he's going to be ordained a deacon July 25th. They're both from our parish of St. Magdalene, so we're so very blessed. I think it's a product of Eucharistic adoration here. Uh, so let's uh, continue to pray for, to keep vocations in the pipeline going. So, Father, I think you have some questions. I do. Let's see here. Dear fathers, I'm truly enjoying the show. Thank you for taking time to do this for us. I'd love to hear how writing books together began. How did you decide the subject of your books? And thank you, Michelle. Michelle, uh, we wrote our first book, uh, which was uh, Catholicism for Dummies, back in 2003 under the reign of uh, St. John Paul II. 
and then it was revised under the reign of uh, Pope Benedict XVI, and then revised again, third edition as it is now, under Pope Francis. So every time we have a new edition, there's a new pope. There's a new pope. Well, actually, I think that's how it goes. The new pope, new edition. Yeah. So, um, and they all have the imprimatur from the bishops. The first one was Bishop, Archbishop Beekline, where the book was printed in uh, Indianapolis. The second one was from uh, Archbishop Myers, the arch. Bishop of, New, of Newark, New Jersey at the time, and the third one by our own bishop, Bishop Cecchio. And even this book here, which we wrote, I think around 2004, has a imprimatur as well, which I think is also Archbishop Myers too. Um, but anyways, uh, getting back to that question, uh, it started off with uh, someone, uh, uh, the, the, the company, which is called Wiley Publication, uh, actually, I probably should let Father John talk a little bit about that because he was the initial contact. But uh, Wiley Publication, who happened to also produce the books by Edgar Allan Poe, it's a very old company, uh, and it was originally located in New York, and then after 9-11, they moved to Hoboken, New Jersey. But it's a very old company. Well, they bought the Dummy series, which there's about 750 uh, titles uh, or so on, on um, different topics from plumbing to... Italian and Spanish Cats languages. Cats for dummies, dogs for dummies. Even Raising Rabbits for Dummies, I think. There was a book for there, too. So they wanted a, um, at the time, there was a great team, a Jewish rabbi and a Catholic priest from Long Island who had a TV show, and they were called the God Squad. And so they wanted a people, a, a priest like the God Squad, so to speak, to uh, write this book and help to promote it. Now, this is where Father John has a most interesting take on that. So I'm going to turn the camera over to him. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, Father Briganti and I were at Barnes & Noble one night taking a peek around, as we usually did on Friday evenings. And and having we, a cappuccino after. We stumbled across um, a title from another publisher, and it was the uh, Complete Idiot's Guide to Catholicism. And we're looking at it, I said, Oh, geez, there were things I think we, we could have, we would have done differently. I said, what a, you know, what a missed opportunity. And we were just talking about it. Well, about a month or two later, I get an email saying, would you be interested in doing Catholicism for dummies? And I thought that was a gag that someone heard my story and was pulling my chain, uh, like one of my classmates, like Father Moran or something like that. So I ignored it. A second one came in. I ignored it. Third one, please, uh, if you're, if you're not, you don't want to do it, let me know somebody that might want to do it. I said, hmm, this looks interesting. So I then responded to that email, and this lady who's a book agent who did some work uh, as an agent to get authors for the Dummy series said she's not Catholic, she's Lutheran. She was watching the uh, Web of Faith that Father Levis and I were doing uh, on EWTN. Uh, that's Web of, Web of Faith 1.0. And... Uh, it was in dubbed in Spanish, and she's watching this in, in Puerto Rico in, in, uh, on the Puerto, beach, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, well, she was watching, she was at the hotel oh, anyway, okay. and all she could understand because she didn't speak Spanish, she saw that my name on there. She figured, oh, he looks like a priest, and uh, <laughs> so she got my email address, and you know, and I said, well, I could do it, but there was a very strict uh, framework. They and wanted it frame, done yeah. in so many months, like six months they wanted the manuscript, nine months they wanted to go to press. And I was a pastor of two parishes at that point. And I said, that's going to be tight. I said, how about if I get someone to help me? And she said, oh, yeah, you can have a co-author if you want. So I called Father Briganti, and he's, oh, yeah, sure. So then we split it up, even Stephen. We both did the same amount of chapters, sent it in, edit And thank goodness um, the Internet was in full blast then. You know, this is 2002, 2003. And we did all our research through the Internet. They would send it back with huge red Corrections, lots things. of corrections, and again, because uh, they had to fit it into their format. Yeah, and the but format yet was we the had most to important. give the final approval because we didn't want them to take out anything that would compromise the doctrine. So yeah. we always had the final approval and say, "Well, no, this has to stay in," or or whatever. Yeah, content they were flexible on. Uh, they figured we knew what we were talking about, but the format right. was was the um, you know Rosetta Stone, so to speak, and like you had to start every paragraph off whatever gerundiv. Uh, that's an ing word, and uh, we had to do that. And they had other, you know, the paragraphs could only be so many words, but we did it. And then we figured, you know, this is this is, was uh, interesting. We even had to approve the cartoons that they wanted to put in. Yeah, there were a couple. We had, yeah. we had a Nick's on <laughs> no, there. No, no, I know. But uh, the interesting thing was that when we were all finished, 
uh, it was Father Briganti who mentioned this to his bishop, who said, you know, if you guys got an imprimatur, you could maybe use this book for CCD, for RCIA. We never even thought about that. Yeah. It's, it's a dummy we didn't book. even thought about getting an imprimatur at the time. And right? I happened to be at the bishop's conference uh, in um, Washington, D.C. at the time. Uh, I was covering it for the Confraternity Catholic Clergy, and I met with Archbishop Beekline, uh, who was a Benedictine. He was the Archbishop of Indianapolis. And he was also, at that moment, the chairman of the Bishop's Committee on the New Catechism. Uh, that came out in 1992, and they were the Bishops were going to make their own version of it. And I happened to say to him, you know, would you be interested? Uh, and uh, he gave the book to um, his censor, Lebrorum, uh, Monsignor Shadow. He read it on Friday and finished it on uh, Sunday night. Monday morning, March 25th, Feast of the Annunciation, we got the imprimatur. And uh, so we were so happy about that. And then th that became such a, a wide, a good success that the company then had us write uh, not only Catholicism for dummies, but Catholic Mass for dummies. We did Women in the Bible for dummies, Saints for dummies, John Paul II for dummies. And uh, we were an expert on dummies. Yeah, we were the dummies priest. And then this book here, which is an uh, idiot's guide, because this is a it's different better to be a here. dummy than an idiot. Isn't yes. that what you always say, Father? I always say that. <laughs> I always say that, yes. But here's a little, uh, a lot, lot of people of the older generation didn't know about the dummy series. So uh, oh, we, we got hate mail from little old ladies in Pasadena. So does the Pope know you're writing that? And, and I wrote back. I said, I said, we gave a copy to Pope Benedict. And then they write back and say, well, what does he what know? What does he know? <laughs> and this one woman kept insisting that it was sacrilegious because she said, you're calling Catholicism uh, a name, Catholicism for dummies. I said, it's not an insult to the topic or to the reader. And I finally said, and you know what? Read First Corinthians. St. Paul says, we're fools for Christ. Uh, is he calling you a fool? He's using a figure of speech. And in fact, the, the Greek word he uses, moroi, literally translates not fools, but morons. You morons for Christ. And I wrote that to this lady, and she says, and what does St. Paul know? <laughs> You're not going to win that one. Let's put it that Forget way. Forget it. But, you know, interesting enough, uh, it's, it, the, the whole concept of the series is not to, be, is not to um, water anything down, but rather it's put in the format that's very palatable for people who want to have an introduction. And it, what, what's great about it is because it really follows both formats. It follows their, their dummy series formats with the, the way the paragraph structure and the cartoons and all that in there, but also follows the structure of the catechism of the Catholic Church. So what's nice about it is it's a good segue into the catechism, uh, which we have, um, we've both taught RCIA as young priests, and we both found that there was not just the right book to give out, like, some people are in the in the class could be very advanced. Uh, some people are just scraping along. So what this series here does, it's good for a broad uh, amount of people. But then you can say, but for those who want a little bit more, say, well, in the catechism we follow this, this, and this. So it was a great segue. It's just enough if that's all you can have. But it's also a good segue into the catechism, yeah. so like a primer almost. And it follows the same uh, outline. Right. The four pillars of the faith that are in the catechism are the four major parts of our book. You've got the Apostles' Creed, which covers the doctrine. You've got the seven sacraments, which, which follows the church's worship. Ten Commandments, which is the moral teaching of the church. And then the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, which covers the spiritual and prayer life. So just as that's in the in the catechism, we use that same format in the book. And... We did a TV version of this. Right. Uh, we weren't. We didn't own the copyright to the title, so we couldn't call it Catholicism for Dummies TV show. So we had to adjust it. So it was Crash Course in Catholicism. So the commercial it had Father John and I like the Crash Dummies. There's the segue there, and we're always getting into an accident in in the in the commercial. We even so, wrote a Harley Davidson for one right. of the promos. Yeah, Father Ken was in the to sidecar. Go back to EW Tan and get the, those old uh, those yeah. old series. We're in our cassocks yeah. on a. <laughs> on a motorcycle. A yeah, and of course the Harley's not going anywhere. So it was an antique We were allowed Harley, to take it anywhere. <laughs> but the background scene shows it. We use so one of those green screens. There's the magic of EWTN. We're telling yeah. all the secrets now. Yeah. But uh, then it, the segue there is then we uh, op uh, we wrote for two other companies. We wrote for the Everything Company, which was like the Idiot's Guide and Catholic. It was since then bought out by the Essential, 
which now is out of print. Yes. It was the essential uh, Bible. So it was like an introductory to the Bible. The uh, other one we wrote for is this one here, source books, 300 yeah, questions. 300 and, answers. and there's a little story with that one too because uh, we were sending the chapters by email. And at one point I got this letter or email saying, okay, we're ready to go. But I looked at it and it said 285 questions. And I said, I sent you 300. No, we only got 285. Who's going to, who's going to sell a book for 280, 200? People want to say, are these guys so stupid? They come up, couldn't come up with 15 more questions. Here, that last email got lost. And once I found it, they adjusted it. So it's 300 because 285 just sounds weird. Yeah, that's weird. a PU. Anyways, <laughs> uh, that, uh, so that's the, really the whole story there. And, um, it, it was, it, we enjoyed, right? I think we wrote so altogether 10 books. And um, it was very enjoyable to do. At one one book, uh, two books actually, we had a third author. One was John Paul II for Dummies, and we had our uh, a priest from our diocese. Your neighbor up the road here, yep, Father, Father Tovarowski. J, Father Jay Tovarowski. And then the um, the other book, Catholic Mass for Dummies, we had uh, Monsignor Cafone uh, write a section. But unfortunately, he got sick during the writing, so he only wrote a little section of it. Uh, so it was and it ended up being Father John and myself t uh, doing most of the book there. But he was able to get us the imprimatur for that from Archbishop Myers. So we thank, uh, rest in peace, Monsignor Cafone is now gone, not here with us. But um, it was very helpful. Anyways, Michelle, we hope that that answered your question. And um, thank you for asking. It brings up a lot of nostalgia and, uh, and history. So, well, dear Padre, I love praying the Liturgy of the Hours. However, I find it strange that the English translation approved by the United States contains hymns by Martin Luther. Why are there Protestant hymns, and even if they're not theoretic, theologically erroneous, doesn't having a hymn by Martin Luther in such an important prayer give a wrong impression that he's all right? Thanks, Pox, Daniel from Flemington. Well, Daniel, uh, it is a good question. We have to remember, first and foremost, that these hymns are examined, they're looked at, and then there's a com there's a committee uh, from the Bishops um, Conference, the USCCB, um, has a committee that examines uh, the things. And all, obviously, too, we have ISIL, which is the International Commission on English and the Liturgy. Uh, they had to examine the, the scripture passages, uh, the Grail Psalter that was uh, the, the four bulk week of the cycle of the bulk of the of the book is um, on the on the Psalms, and the hymns that are in there. Now, the the typical text is in Latin, and those Latin hymns don't always translate that well uh, directly into the vernacular. So some of them do, like the Tantum Ergo and O Solitaris. Other ones, uh, and they want to make it, you know. Um, applicable in the local area. Now, I, I, I agree with you that some of the hymns, like um, uh, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, um, is in there. Uh, there's nothing theologically bad about that. Uh, Amazing Grace is something I and other uh, priests have and theologians have problems with because there's that one phrase, that saved a wretch like me. Uh, that's part of Luther's theology. He literally thought human nature became decrepit and decayed uh, you know that uh, instead of the human nature being wounded by original, yeah, sin. then I mean, it was in other words created good but wounded by original sin. Went, and and he even described the grace as just covering it over, like when when it snows and Pooch did his business outside. Uh, he used a more graphic word in German that we're, we're not going to use, but that image that grace just covers it over. Whereas Trent said no, uh, sin wounded human nature, it did not destroy it, uh, and that which is wounded can be healed. Okay, if it's destroyed, you know, it just, you know, all you could do is bury it and, and, and sweep it away. Now, that being said, the hymns that are, that are in the, the breviary are not part of the church's solemn magisterium. They're, they're hymns, and they can be amended, they can be removed, they can be replaced. Uh, they're not part. Now, obviously, if there's going to be something very overtly uh, or even sus suspiciously heretical, they're not going to be in the book. Uh, the fact that they can have some other um, opinions they, or uh, interpretations is another matter. And there are still Latin hymns in there uh, that you can uh, choose. Uh, the Anglican hymns that are in there are very high church 
and, and theologically beautiful. And we often sing some of those Anglican hymns in, uh, at Mass. Uh, they're incorporated in the St. Michael's Hymnal or in the Ignatius Press uh, Mislet. So they're all theologically fine. Um, um, so the, um, with the problem with uh, some of these hymns too, hymnology, are also more with the contemporary ones that they put in at the time. You have to more so than Luther. The, yeah, the more modern ones are even worse. You know, um, there was one, Sing to the Mountains, and there, I forgot, Father George Wortlow used to say, yeah. we used to sing to the saints and about the saints and about the angels and God and his throne. Now we sing to mountains. And, uh, birds and trees. And birds and trees. <laughs> and um, so... You know, sometimes it's the new Catholic hymns that I have more problems with than the uh, old uh, high church Anglican Protestant hymns uh, that could be very beautiful um, and theologically correct. Also, too, if you remember, uh, if you're an older person, uh, up until 1965, hymns were really not sung in church, maybe on a low mass, uh, but um, definitely was not part of the Mass, it usually was uh, the the antiphons, the introit, the communion antiphon, and uh, the parts of the Mass, and there might be a, um, a, a choir or a cantor singing a communion meditation, depending on the on the, the rank of the Mass, if it was low Mass, Misa Cantata, or high Mass, you know, there was different ways. So hymnology, uh, uh, which is a study of hymns, were really not part of, of the Catholic tradition as we say it. It was as you mentioned, it was more of a Protestant um, uh, tradition. But now, since the reforms of the Second Vatican Council, uh, it was allowed to introduce him. So we didn't really have a large Catholic hymn uh, pool to go to. We had a few, uh, which were usually sung at devotions and things of that nature, or as I mentioned, low masses, but not a lot. So that's when the, when the, when the breviary was being written, and I think it hasn't been updated since it originally They're came out. They're working on it right now. And uh, so that's going back almost 50 years. So at the time, they didn't have a big pool uh, to go to. So uh, that was that, that's why we have some of these uh, these hymns in there. But also, some of the at the time they were considered contemporary. Now we would consider really outdated uh, in the in the Catholic modern hymns. And there was a um, an Irish edition of the breviary. Uh, there was a British one too, which is yes, nice. which. Those hymns are very nice, yeah. and um, I know a priest friend of mine, he does the English uh, Liturgy of the Hours, but all the hymns he copied from the standard typical Latin text, so he does the, the, op the hymn for the opening of those hours in Latin, and then he does the rest of the office in English. Now, and, and also, too, I I hymns are very important, you're right, uh, because they express a theology, and that's why... Uh, here at St. Magdalene's, uh, I inherited the St. Michael Hymnal, which is very good. It has some contemporary stuff in there, too, which were not bad. Uh, but also, I switched the missile, uh, the missalette for the people, although we can't use them now in the coronavirus time. But um, it's the Ignatius Press, and they have very good hymns as well. Uh, because when we're praying and we're singing this, it's reflecting our religion and our faith. So that's why hymns are important. Uh, that they are theologically correct. So, Daniel, very astute for you uh, to to uh, pick this out. And hopefully the new edition that's coming out, ISIL is a lot better now than it was 50 years ago. Um, and um, so we're hoping that, uh, although it was so interesting, when Father John and I were young seminarians, uh, that that's was going back, back. 1980s, <laughs> there was a priest, Father William Height, who was a Benedictine, and he worked at Liturgical Press, and uh, and uh, he was asked to leave liturgical press because he was too, too orthodox and too Catholic. So he ended up in the seminary we were at. And so he said, and this was now 1980s, 83. And we'd say, oh, Father, when are we uh, going to get a new um, a new translation of the breviary? And uh, and he just would go into a t tirade, says probably not for a very long time. the second coming of Christ. And boy, <laughs> is he right. We're still now 32 years later as yeah. priests, we're still waiting for that translation. So but it'll be out. Uh, hopefully in Father Matthew's time, <laughs> there will actually be a new translation. Yeah, maybe. So, After he's been because, ordained, you know, the missile, 32 years maybe. Because the Roman Missals changed, the prayers in the Roman Missal, like the closing prayers, which also we use in the breviary, are changed. So in the electronic breviary, we can get those um, new prayers in there. Yeah. But in the old standard printed one, we still have that. Now, there's that. one hymn they sing at morning prayer sometimes, Morning Has Broken. And it drives me nuts because when I was high school seminary, 
we literally had the Cat Stevens version played on a cassette player in the chapel. And that's all I think of whenever we Which sing that. Which the Vatican also says that's wrong, too, to use uh, electronic things like cassette players. Well, back then that. we showed film strips yeah. on balloons, and yeah. uh, we did Song of Silence by Sarman and Garfunkel. Just thank God, Daniel, <laughs> that we're not in that era anymore, yes. and that we are yes. uh, going better and better as we, as we move along. <laughs> all right. I think you have one for me, Father. Okay. Dear Father, what is your opinion on the prodigal son parable? Did the elder son go back into the house to celebrate his father's homecoming, or did he shy away? Many of us have been put in this awkward situation with family. Curious as to your thoughts, and that's from Rich in Flemington. Well, Rich, um, there's not much more on the elder son except that he was um, not very happy person. He was bummed out. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, to a point he was justified. You know, he said his brother was, a you know, a scamp. <laughs> and he uh, took all the uh, uh, money and was bad to his father and lived a dissolute light. Uh, dissolute and, living of dissipation. <laughs> right. And um, and so, you know, in a way, uh, he was – and and what – the elder brother was there. He was taking care of his father, taking care of the property, being the faithful uh, brother or the faithful son that he was. And then, you know, the other guy comes back, you know, because he's out of money and, and – and, uh, Although very resolute and very, you know, humble and said, I'll take a servant's job, you know. But uh, the other brother felt, well, hey, you're killing the steer for this this fella. Or, I don't even get a kid go. He says, yeah, you know, and having a party <laughs> and all that. Cat. All the father's saying is, I'm just so happy he's Dad's back. That's favorite. And, uh, and the other one's saying, hey, I've been here. So he sort of has a little grudge, which can also be simple. Sibling rivalry. You know, envious and jealous over that. Because maybe he wanted to have that dissolute life, you know, and he didn't, you know. So there's a lot of psychology going on in here. But what happens at the end is the father says, hey, you're getting all the money. He spent his. So chillax a little bit. Let me celebrate my son coming back, you know. Uh, and we don't really know what happened after that with the older brother. We don't know if he said, yeah, you're right, dad, you know. Uh, it is a fable. <laughs> it's not. My bank account's still <laughs> safe. Story. You know, he's not touching it's it. It's a or, story, or, uh, <laughs> or or what have you, or if he's going to have his own party in addition. So, um, but I think there are a lot of lessons here. I think we can reflect on the on the attitude of the elder. We will often reflect on the younger one, the prodigal mm -hmm. son, but we never really reflect on the attitude of the elder, which many times, as you mentioned in here, could be our situation. You know, the faithful child who takes care of the elder parents, and then when the elder parents dies, the all the the rest show up and said, "Hey, where yeah, we go?" Yeah, they want the couch, the you car. Know? Yeah. So, any yeah, I, I mean, this is typical sibling rivalry, and uh, being the older brother myself, I can identify with this guy because you know the younger one goes out and spends it on. I hope on, his uh, older his younger brother is not <laughs> watching this. Life of <laughs> dissipation with loose women. I love how the yeah. the. Scriptures uh, record that. But again, as Father Ken said, we could fit ourselves into either the, the young son or the elder son because you could resent the fact that somebody who's been wayward comes back, and we should rejoice. And notice what the son says, the elder son, this son of yours, and his father corrects him and says, no, you know, um, your brother. That He was referring, instead of saying, oh, my brother's back, he says, no, your son. But that's his brother. And he wants to cut the connection between him and his brother, but, and his father says, but Father, no. often when we're in trouble, didn't our mother say to our fathers, your son yeah, <laughs> got yeah, in trouble? Yeah, that's when the, so the mom or dad said, no, no, he, he's ours. Yeah. And, um, and also I'd like to point out that the word prodigal means excessive. And although the younger son was excessive that he squandered, the father was excessive in a good way. Because he, you could call him the prodigal father, because he went overboard in his mercy and kindness and patience with Junior. Now he doesn't go drag him back, but he throws a ring on his finger, purple on him. So the father shows us that we should not be stingy in our forgiveness. Or father mercy. John, unfortunately, we have to be stingy with oh. time. We're at an end of another terrific episode, and I hope you and no kid go. Uh, if you care to send in some more questions. Uh, uh, we will be putting the email address up there, and uh, we'd like to answer yours. They're kind of fun to do so. Uh, and also, um, you can view us 
or you can tell other people to view us on our website, the St. Magdalene Flemington, New Jersey website. And um, YouTube. Well, I'm sorry, that's the YouTube. You're yes. right. That's the YouTube. Thank you for your correction, Father. See, I always have to have uh, Father <laughs> yeah. Judge to keep me on the railroad track. To, uh, He's to, the older priest. Yeah, to, today, I've been saying, uh, and forever, 36 years ordained, and I don't know why, the correct would be 30 I'm two, seconds. I'm two years. weeks older in ordination, so, but yeah. younger chronologically. There you go. <laughs> so, and also, we'd like to thank you for your donations uh, that you keep on sending into the parish, either by the, uh, by the um, traditional envelope. Or you can look at the exciting webinar on our website to see if you like to look go into the electronic giving. And, of course, Regina Evershine in our business office can help you with that. She's waiting for your call. She is waiting. Yeah. And then texting and PayPal are other options that you can do as well. So there's wonderful options here. Finally, we thank our producer and our editor and, and cameraman and sound man uh, for bringing this uh, to you. And he's he, and he I, also I really does the, the, he also the, does the daily effects. mass. Yeah, he, he does, does the, the daily mass. But I also like the little special effects that yeah. he tries to make the end, the beginning kind of interesting. You know, to 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 bring draw you in. That's Father Matthew Marinelli, and um, we come to the conclusion of uh, to give you a blessing. The so, Lord be with you and with your spirit. May the Almighty God, God bless, bless you, you, the, the Father, Father, the Son, and the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Until we see you next time, stay healthy. Bye-bye.